morning, everybody. Um, you're very welcome to the Infomar webinar for 2021. Uh, my name is Coon Verbruggen. I'm the director of Geological Survey Ireland. We're one of the project partners in the Infomar program. And it's my pleasure to be able to invite you this morning to catch up with what's been happening with Infomar and particularly to focus on offshore renewable energy. Uh, our annual seminars are normally a good occasion for us to catch up with our stakeholders uh, find out what's been going on uh, with the program and with the stakeholders and to move around the country and meet people in some of the different areas, particularly where we've been working or where the crews have been based. We did this in 2019 in Dingle. We had a great, a great seminar. Uh, it seems like a long time ago now, <laughs> uh, which was focused very much on, on marine tourism, leisure, shipwrecks, local people, uh, how Infomar can connect with the community. This, this year, we're online. Um, the downside is we're not in a nice location somewhere in the country. The upside is we've almost 300 people registered today. And I'm delighted we've that many people willing to join us and able to give us a couple of hours to catch up with what's been going on. The focus today is on offshore renewable energy, which has become probably one of the key sectors now for the Infomar program. Interestingly, it was one of the key uh, factors in the decision by the government back in 2006, back when I was project, one of the co-project managers, to give Infomar the go-ahead. When uh, at that stage, our, our early attempts in, in offshore renewable energy were being, being encouraged. Um, earlier this year at the MRIA, the Marine Renewable Industry Association seminar, there was an opening address given by, a very stirring opening address given by Mark Mellet, now the head of the Defence Forces where we reviewed the progress we've made in relation to Ireland's offshore, the importance of our marine territory in all its aspects. And he name-checked very well an awful lot of the people who've been involved in this, this journey, as he called it, this story to date. Uh, I was very heartened to hear that in that, in that list, he, he mentioned Pat McArdle, my predecessor's director, Mick Gagan, who was project manager for the Irish National Seabed Survey, and Peter Heffernan, former head of the Marine Institute. Because the seabed mapping story in Ireland has been part of the offshore renewable energy story, but it is, it is wider than that. Um, and it's a, the whole ORE uh, story, like so much, ha has a lot of different moving parts. So today what we want to do is we want to focus on what's happening with Infomar and how we can play our part in it. How can the government's acquisition of seabed mapping data, which is a world-class program, almost unique in its scope. How can it play its part? And how can we make sure that we get the most out of the state investment in that? And how the industry can then, and the other players can work with that. And there are many players and many parts to this. We see that we're aware of the, the science side, we deal with the university side of it. But key to all of this as well is policy, that we have the policy in the right place. Um, and that we're developing the right regulations, the right legislation. And on the panel, we'll get it. I'm delighted we've got some people who are leading in that uh, to discuss that. Another key part of it is the private sector, because we need investment to build these wind farms and to get the, to get the industry moving. And we'll have a representative uh, from that, from the Peter Coy of the MRIA on the, on the panel later on. And, uh, and an example as well of someone who's working for one of the new industries, the new companies that has come out of this directly from the universities, exactly the kind of thing we hope will happen. Uh, the other key part is the community and the community engagement. And we hope that sessions like this today, webinars like this that put all the information out there for, for people will help dispel myths and install facts into the discussion that needs to, needs to take place and the debates that need to take place as we move forward with really, really ambitious plans. On Tuesday this week, the government published the Climate Action Bill with ambitious targets for decarbonisation that will require serious development of our offshore renewable energy, first on the East Coast, but ultimately on the South and West Coast. And that will require strong public support. As well as uh, the focus on ORE, we will also hear uh, uh, an update on Infomar's 2020 program, uh, what they got completed, which I'm particularly impressed that despite all the, the COVID restrictions and the various uh, uh, issues that had to be dealt with, they had a very busy and very full program last year. And also their plans this year for 2021, as we work towards that target of end 2026, 
having all of Ireland's marine territory mapped and being the first country, first sizable country in the world to, to reach that target. We'll also hear about the MSC and remote sensing module that's been developed here at GSI. We'll hear from Javi Montes giving an update on that. Ron Natul will talk about the particular support being developed at Informar, particular tools being developed for that. And we'll hear about two new reports that are being released today. Uh, one from Ilmatic Energy, one from GDG, looking at where outside companies looked at the Informar data sets and looked at how they could be best used in, in the, in the, to support ORE, what other things could be done, what other data exists, what other tweaks could take place. And we're particularly keen to see the results of those uh, coming out from those reports today. Uh, we're, we're also delighted to be able to launch new data and products today. And Peter Heat from the Informar team at GSI will give us a short overview on those, uh, both uh, the data viewers, an overview of the existing data viewers and the services, which we've uh, added to over the last year, and a new sub-bottom profile web map viewer. So this is data that's routinely acquired, but not always readily available and can be sometimes hard to interrogate or hard to acquire. And we're hoping that this will be a big step forward for people knowing what data exists, what quality it is, can readily see this on a viewer and then can go and acquire and download the full data if they want to work further with it. That's a big step forward. And I want a big shout out to Dave Hardy and the team who've, who've worked on developing that. Uh, we'll conclude with a panel discussion, as I said, which looks at ORE and Informar um, and what's happening around, around the policy, around the data, what the specifications um, and what needs to happen then. And we'll also get a chance to have a, a poll uh, to ask you, the audience, uh, for your views. Um, and that'll, that'll appear uh, by magic on your, in your webinar. So please take part in that. And also, I want to just say, uh, if you could... If you have questions, we'll try and take questions throughout the seminar, and I'll, I'll come back to them at the end. Uh, so please use the Q&A box uh, to put in any, any questions, and we'll try and catch them up with our chairs as we go through the session. Um, so that, that's our, our program for this morning. It should take two hours, so uh, please bear with us. Uh, as always, we're online <clears throat> dealing with the different issues. So start, starting off, I'd like to introduce... Uh, Tommy Fury, who's a project manager for, uh, for Informar at the Marie Institute, and Sean Cullen will follow, for, uh, who's the program manager for Informar at GSI. And they will uh, run through their presentation, which is an Informar 2020 update and plans for 2021. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Sean Cullen and I would like to, as joint program managers for Informar, give you an update on our program, the activity we've been involved in recently, and our 2021 survey plans. Uh, I also want to give you key dates for our annual seminar, which will take place November 15th coming in Cork, hopefully in person, all going well. Uh, and it's back to back with Hydro, Hydro 21, which is an international conference for hydrography, November 16th to 18th, also in Cork. Uh, I also want to touch on some of the research and innovation projects we're involved in, and Sean will, will focus in on some of the, the points that I've been touching on. For anybody who's not aware of, of Informar, it's a national seabed mapping program. It is funded by the Department of Environment, Climate and Communications. It runs through to end 2026 with an overall funding envelope of 80 million euros and a cost benefit analysis indicating a return on investment to the state of four to six times. It's a GSI and MI partnership. We jointly manage the program. Uh, we are addressing 23, action 23 of the Harnessing Our Ocean Wealth. We're embedded in the 2020 program for government and also in the climate action plan. Our focus is large scale mapping, acquiring seabed data, uh, we have a sub-program also on data exchange integration and on value-added exploitation. We're supporting cross-sectoral cross development in Ireland and spatial resource and risk management. The plan is to grow data availability, scientific advice, and to generate economic impact. We want to deliver data-enabled decisions for Ireland. The model is to develop uh, relevant outputs to grow capacity build and partnerships, and to increase infrastructure, knowledge, and collaboration in the marine. From a technology perspective, 
We want to utilize state-of-the-art equipment. We deploy multiple platforms from drones through to vessels and, and we use remote sensing. We are also involved in a lot of research innovation projects, which we leverage to support uh, the above. We want to strengthen data integration and interdisciplinary engagement. And the products we create are all free, open and accessible for exploration development and blue growth in Ireland. Informer activity is tracked through our website primarily. You can look at our surveys tab and you can drill down to the plans and progress by year. The last full publication of our annual activity has been in 2019. The current 2020 uh, report is being finalized and will be published in quarter two. Data, maps and equipment relevant to offshore renewable energy. Multi-beam acoustics uh, is our primary tool. We uh, generate full coverage bathymetry and backscatter maps, as you see on the left there. But we also have geophysical tools, sub-bottom profile data, bottom center image, which if the penetration is good enough to reach bedrock, allows us to generate isopax thickness to, thickness to, um, to bedrock, for example. We have an array of ground truthing and uh, geophysical tools to acquire ancillary data to augment the acoustics. The web map services will be touched on by Peter shortly, but just to have, show you an example, this is a seabed classification map and it's a blend of physical sample locations and acoustic data which we use to derive these interpretive products of our seabed class. Towards full coverage mapping, our aspiration is full land to sea integrated models. We have web map services demonstrating the coverage to date. It takes time to get the data from the vessel processed and into these services. So the coverage that you see on our bathymetric viewer is slightly behind the time we acquire data in 2020, which is currently just being finalized in terms of processing, and that will be added into the viewer in due course. The areas that are hatched in this graphic in, in, in the red polygon there are areas that we targeted in 2020. And despite the COVID challenges, that were in the year we had. We uh, had a very successful year and we managed to keep operations up and running. We now have 39,000 square kilometres approximately left to map offshore Ireland to fill in the gaps that are in blue on those two graphics. We're averaging about 10,400 square kilometres per year over the last three years, so we're well on track to completing in 2026. This year, we will be doing a lot of work on processing, interpretation and data integration to update the, the web services to reflect more closely where we are in terms of in terms of full coverage to date. This is on the left, a graphic showing our 2021 survey plan. The larger Marine Institute vessels will work to the south uh, and hopefully touch a little bit on the northwest off Donegal to, uh, to support an interreg project. And the inshore geological survey fleet will work coastally and uh, in the contingency area to the southwest and west. In terms of value added exploitation and research and innovation activity, we're trying to span key areas in terms of land to sea. The geological survey are involved in the Cherish Ireland Wales program funded initiative, which is coastal marine heritage. Both organizations are involved in different strands of EMODnet, that's the European Marine Observation Data Network. We have collectively developed and delivered an MSC module in seabed mapping. In terms of mapping to model, Marine Institute is involved in a Horizon 2020 program, Mission Atlantic in and around ecosystem assessment. We have collectively input with multiple government departments on the Sea Rover project, acquiring three years of large scale benthic habitat, reef habitat mapping offshore using the, the Aura v Holland one. And that's currently undergoing a synthesis report, which will inform policy. From the perspective of advancing technology, we have a lot of smaller projects, but the Geological Survey of Ireland are involved in a coastal vulnerability project funded by the European Space Agency. Uh, at this point, I'm going to hand you back to Sean Cullen in Geological Survey to pick up on a few finer details that I've touched on during the course of the slides. Thank you. Well, thanks for that, Tommy. That was a great overview of Infomar. I'm just going to concentrate a little bit on the on the data now. Um, 
as as Tommy was saying there, that the area covered by Inframar is huge. Um, and you can see from the sort of overview images, like this one here, which is some of the inshore mapping, that quite big areas offshore are covered. And a lot of that in resolution terms, you would see on our viewers at around either two meter grids or five meter grids. But as we move closer inshore, you can see that we've, um, yeah, there's a lot more effort that goes in as it gets shallower and shallower to cover the same sort of areas. And this is the southwest of Ireland. And you can see in Kenmare River there, there is what we call the white ribbon left around the edges of the data that's already been gathered. But in and around Baltimore and um, Bantry Bay, you can see we've gone really close inshore. And that's pretty much the way we've mapped all the way from Dundalk in the northeast, all the way down the east coast and the south coast. And now we're just starting to turn the corner to go up um, north along the west coast. So this is just another representation of the, the data in and around uh, Roaring Water Bay. And you can see as we zoom in on the data, how much more of the, the resolution sort of jumps out at you. And a lot of this data now would be gridded at two meters. And then as we get really close inshore there, this is where the, the value to the ORE sector is gonna be looking at the, the coastline really for um, landing areas for cables. And um, I think it, it's invaluable to, to look at data in this sort of detail, uh, which travels all the way offshore and picking out routes to come ashore are gonna be uh, key. And I think Inframar data is gonna be a big player in that sector. This is just zooming right in now. That's the bull and the calf off Dersey Island. And you can see the geology very clearly there. And again, this is gridded at two meters. But I, what, what I do just wanna get across to everybody today is that we have this data in the raw format. So if, um, developers want to look at the data in the highest resolution, we can supply the data in the raw format. However, you would have to have a fairly large server and, and the software to, to deal with that. Uh, but we are open to negotiate on how we can help you out in that department. And then just finally, looking at the resolution side, this is the, the wreck, the Manchester Merchant in uh, Dingle Bay. And here you can see the resolution of individual ribs and the boilers and the propeller shaft on the ship that's um, sank there. And then just finally, to reiterate the fact that we come in that close to shore, um, this is uh, something we hope that's of use to the ORE industry. So thanks for very much for watching and I hope we can see you all in person in November at our seminar on November the 15th down in Cork. Thank you. Hello, my name is Xavier Montes, Senior Geologist at TSI, and I will introduce you briefly on behalf of all the team one of our latest Informar developments in the marine maritime education sector in Ireland, the Informar graduate training program. An idea has been there for a few years now, but only started to shape up in 2019, as generally happens by adding uh, key milestones to the roadmap. The first milestone in early 2020, an MSc module to be delivered in Maynooth University in the geography department, and the offshore component in partnership with the smart school training. And right after, second milestone in partnership with Eurofit Plus, the pan-European initiative towards a floating university, bridging the gap between national marine programs, industry, societal challenges, science, and knowledge sharing. Starting from our passion for the sea and our mission statement aligned with Ireland's marine plan, Action 23 explicitly states training Irish graduates. <clears throat> Obviously in what we know in more depth, mapping the seabed and everything surrounding it, from planning, data acquisition, 
product development, technological developments, to how we make these products more relevant to society and how we engage with our stakeholders. Also convey our experience to map the complexity of the programs network at national and international scale. And we will see more of this international side as we move on with the talk. So, and when I mentioned earlier what we know, I mean our true area of expertise reflected in this long journey from deep waters to the Irish shores. It's been 20 years of program since 1999, continually mapping the seafloor and making it available to, our, to the wider community. Over time, we've used numerous boats, technologies, and planning every year, aligning our activities to support diverse national policies, a changing national policies, I would say. As an example, increasing offshore renewable energy capacity as part of climate action targets. Ireland's Infomar is a modest but well-recognized international brand, as our network includes expanse of a global organization such as the Pan-European Imonets, the IHO International Hydrographic Office, the JEPCO Association, and NOAA, just to mention a few. Also, our data products can be accessed from any part of the planet via the web for free, which in return amplifies these worldwide exposures, making the brand even larger. But moving into the first milestone, the MSC module, over a short time window, we have overcome a number of steps that might be of interest to list out. First, find the most suitable host academic partner. We found it in Maynooth University, the longest running remote sensing university model in the country and fully accredited by charter surveyors. Design the module to fit specific educational programs, develop innovative content, maritime training with that Infomar unique edge, develop a unique offshore floating model together in partnership with a smart school training with still a lot of room to expand over the years to come. Align the content with the national marine strategy, training graduates and postgraduates and also training informal staff, an important part of it. I'm not gonna go into the detail, to a lot of detail to sp uh, time spent developing the model but instead, I'll briefly talk about the team. The Infomar team, well experienced with many years mapping the ocean, working up the data and disseminating products, connected to many stakeholders from academia, industry, agents, and from there to the wider community. But to ensure this good ac uh, academic alignment, we counted on with the Maynooth University Geography Department team, Ronan Foley and Conor Cahalan, playing a key role in the development and delivery of this model. On the offshore side, also a strategic partner with the Strategic Marine Alliance for Research and Training, also known as a SMART, led in this case by Jean Boyd. Uh, this combined team with decades of experience coming from many disciplines and backgrounds working together towards a common goal with the additional edge of a long running program like the Infomar. Getting deep into the model's internal structure and the diversity of themes covered, the on-campus part has a comprehensive number of lectures and tutorials covering 30 hours teaching, 15 hours lectures and 15 hours on tutorials. From the ABC of what a program like Infomar entails to the fundamentals of physical scenography, survey planning, basic data acquisition, and the different processing techniques including how we image the seafloor and how we see the subsea floor, and even the inhabitants of this seafloor with the marine habitat lecture, but also placing emphasis in the international network, a program like Infomar is plugged in and its impact at local, national and global scale. Everything surrounding the program. So a lot of material that cannot be found on textbooks. And jumping now to the hands-on tutorials, covering topics such as satellite derived bathymetry, multi-beam processing, both the bathymetry part and the backscatter component, shipwreck imaging and product development, and more to come in areas such as coastal evolution or photogrammetry that are work in progress. Finally, an important part of it is a Q&A session with the team chatting on their educational background, experience, training, and prospect career paths. And that's also an area where we're trying to expand more in the future. 
but showing flexibility, the model was adapted and tested back in mid 2020 in another milestone that I referred before for the European Eurofleets Plus training project. Eurofleets Plus is a unique consortium of research vessels, equipment, and scientists supported by 42 organizations from 24 different countries, primarily in Europe, and Ireland is a member of it. A key objective of Eurofit Plus is, to, is the delivery of five floating universities for early stage researchers on marine related science, which is something very challenging, very difficult because it's difficult to access these large platform ships that are fully equipped. The floating university took place on the research Celtic Voyager in Core Harbor and its approaches on the south coast of Ireland, a perfect natural lab as we have mapped on numerous occasions the area. The offshore component in partnership with the smart training is unique as it offers the student hands-on experience, the opportunity to interact with the vessel and the systems used to image the seafloor, the oceans and the subsea floor. But more important, a truly floating learning platform with professionals. The experience as it now is, it consists of two full days, in this case in Core Harbor, as it offers a, an all weather protection, so a very accessible um, uh, situation, location. The students in this setting work on real, on real case scenarios and experiment with the different roles involved in the offshore surveying world. Moving on, we've seen the recent past, but let's also in the immediate future without going into too much detail. We are working uh, towards completing the content development with a mixture of technical lectures and society relevant challenges such as career development improve learning experience and increase interaction both on campus material and offshore, where the Irish accessibility is probably unique in the world. Increase the number of tutorials as they are key to gain hands-on experience, useful in the professional world. Uh, migration to the online delivery, expansion to multiple stakeholders, both, uh, both at academia and schools nationwide, as well as government agencies and institutes, tailoring context to the existing programs available. And finally, include accreditation, professional and academic. I've talked about the motivation, the structure, and a bit about the future development, but what is the expected impact? Let's start on building national capacity in ocean science by adapting content to existing educational programs. Also by placing the Irish National Civil Mapping Program, a pioneer program at the forefront of the maritime education scene and demonstrate the availability of free and high quality data. More general, increasing ocean literacy and climate change awareness, two important topics for this upcoming decade, on the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. International exposure, Informal has mentioned before, is an international brand, and we want to grow together with our education stakeholders. And relevant to the forum today, that we are today, opening potential new careers avenues for students as the ORE sector is set to grow training graduates will become more important than ever. Opportunities such as the informal marine graduate training is developing the knowledge base in Ireland. Key is to ensure that graduates might be able to access jobs here. Finally, let me finish by acknowledging the people behind all this. Without their work and enthusiasm, this journey that still has a few more stops to go would not have been possible. So thanks to all. And with this, I'll finish my talk. Good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome along to the Informar webinar series, first one of which is looking at Informar's support for the developing offshore renewable energy sector in Ireland. Informar is Ireland's national seabed mapping program, it stands for Integrated Mapping for the Sustainable Development of Ireland's Marine Resource. It's a partnership between the Marine Institute and Geological Survey Ireland and is funded through the Department of the Environment, Climate and Communications. Overall, represents an 80 million euro investment across its lifespan. And when it was examined by PricewaterhouseCoopers a number of years back, um, an estimated cost benefit ratio of four to six times return on investments was uh, determined through that process. Of course, engaging with the offshore renewable energy sector is key to realizing this um, cost benefit over the course of the project's life. 
Uh, the project runs across two phases. Phase one ran from 2006 to 2016, uh, was complete successfully. And phase two runs from 2016 through to the end of 2026. Quick breakdown of my uh, presentation today. I'll be taking a look at Informar and the Climate Action Challenge. Informar is a support for the offshore renewable energy sector in Ireland. The value of this information and why we feel it's really important that uh, this is established and understood. Uh, a program review um, that was carried out externally to really take a deep look at where Informar addresses the ORE sector's information and data requirements. And finally, the outcome of this process and some next steps. Climate Action Bill of 2019 set out some very ambitious targets for offshore winds in Ireland, specifically uh, 3.5 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Action 26 of the plan, which is support the ocean energy research development and demonstration pathway for emerging marine technologies, that's wave, tidal, floating wind, and associated test infrastructure, calls for the completion of the mapping of all Irish offshore waters through the Informar pro program to support site selection for offshore energy. Programme for Government of 2020 further revised these targets upwards to five gigawatts of energy installed by 2030 for offshore wind. In response to the Climate Action Plan, we were asked to look at how Informar supports the sector currently and into the future. A useful reference for this study was the Crown Estates Guide to an Offshore Wind Farm, which gave some indicative costs associated with the various development phases and activities. For example, resource and med ocean studies, engineering and consultancy, and some of the activities that will be tied to them, such as front end engineering design studies. We also looked at where the uh, Informar program uh, could directly support these uh, activities through its uh, current information and data outputs. So while this um, study was a valuable uh, use of resources and um, a useful exercise. It was clear at the end of us that what was really required was to get an external review to really determine and understand the information requirements of the sector so that uh, these could be capitalized upon over the next uh, couple of years of the Informar program. So the Informar project management um, put together a committee which set out the needs for this consultation specifically the ORE industry data requirements in the context of Informar program outputs, the available knowledge and data resources in Ireland, not just Informar, the potential benefits of increased program engagement with industry, the present knowledge and data gaps which can be addressed, and recommendations for enhancing Informar support for offshore renewable energy in Ireland. So we felt that Understanding the value of the information is key to ensuring that we can leverage the maximum value from the 80 million euro investment that's been made in the Informar program over its lifetime. There's of course an opportunity to reduce costs and lead times for developing ORE in Ireland if the data is properly used and engaged with and um, utilized in the various related activities. There's an opportunity to reduce the risk of lost projects due to insufficient ground modeling data. And finally, an opportunity to optimize future data acquisition campaigns and program outputs. So that's the ORE sector is catered for, as well as the various other sectors that are already making extensive use of the Informar data resource. So with that in mind, an RFQ process was undertaken and two excellent proposals were received from Illmatic Energy and GDG which on evaluation we determined would be very useful taken together to provide a balanced industry perspective on the Informar program and the likely data requirements of the ORE sector into the future. So these uh, reports are now going to be made available for, for the public to access on our website and they're going to form key references for the program management now and into the future as we determine our strategy towards the end of the program. Uh, we also feel that the reports will serve as a very useful data brochure for the ORE sector, in particular um, players that may not be familiar with the program and its data outputs. And finally, we feel that these um, reviews 
our reports will be very useful for engaging our stakeholders in the ORE sector because they offer a very useful glimpse of the ORE landscape in Ireland as it currently stands and a useful baseline to uh, refer back to as this uh, industry takes off in Ireland. So the outcome of this process is that both reports will be available online and we encourage you to uh, check them out, review uh, the reports and please give us your feedback. Uh, the first in a new Infomar webinar series. So this presents us with an opportunity to engage with our stakeholders in the ORE sector, but we are hoping to uh, use this format to engage our stakeholders in other sectors across the spectrum. Finally, the launch of a new Infomar sub-bottom data viewer and download service. This is a very exciting development which occurred in parallel to the review process where our data management team um, has rapidly developed an open data viewer and QC service which will let ORE stakeholders or anyone interested in the sub-bottom data asset to uh, access this data, review it online and then download it. So you'll be hearing a little bit more about that later. And finally, uh, we'd like to take the opportunity to really com commence a dialogue on the Infomar program and the ORE sector and where there is opportunity for mutually beneficial engagement. Thanks very much for your attention. I hope that you enjoy this webinar and the talks that are about to follow. Uh, please keep in touch, follow us on Twitter. And if you have any questions in relation to any of the content of this webinar, please feel free to get in contact with us via either Infomar at infomar.ie or email me directly using the email address at the bottom right hand side of your screen. Thanks very much and enjoy the webinar. Hi everyone, I'm James White from Elmatic Energy and I'm going to be talking to you about the ORE Infomar review I carried out on behalf of these fine organisations. Have any of you ever listened to the BBC podcast 13 Minutes to the Moon? It's a podcast that details the Apollo missions in the 1960s and how they went about putting a man on the moon. I was listening to this whilst compiling this report and I could draw parallels between what they were trying to achieve in the US in the 1960s and what we are trying to achieve in Ireland with the ORE sector now. Back then in 1961, JFK announced that the US will commit itself to achieving the goal before the decade is out of landing a man on the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Yes, that's a very famous speech um, from Rice University and was JFK's rallying call to the American people to get behind the space program at the time, which seemed like a farcical idea back in the 1960s to land a human on the moon. But what is uh, of note there in that speech is that it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult, but with the collective energies and skills of everyone, they can make it happen before the decade is out. And you know that's where the parallels start. It's because in the Programme for Government 2020, we have committed to generating five gigawatts of renewable power offshore by 2030, so also within the decade. In 1966, Apollo 1 was constructed and completed. So what's of note here is that there's a quite a large gap or perceived gap between what JFK said in 1961 and what happened in 1966. And again, that's parallels with what's going on now. There's not a lot of turbines offshore at the moment, but a lot of groundwork is going on behind the scenes. And then in 1969, the Apollo 11 mission, Neil Armstrong walks on the moon, probably the most famous thing in the 20th century. And what you can see there is that in a short space of time, between 1966 and 1969, a period of three years, there was rapid acceleration within the space program. And several space missions took place before ch finally achieving their goal of landing a man on the moon in 1969. And I believe it'll be similar here, where we won't see much happening 
in the development side until the end of the decade, and then there'll be a rapid evolution of the ORE sector in Ireland. 30 years after Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, Ireland began its own voyage, voyage of discovery with the Irish National sea, Seabed Survey, which was the precursor to the Infomar programme. And in 2021, we are hoping that the MPDM bill could provide a launch pad for the ORE sectoral development in Ireland. That'll be 60 years after JFK's initial speech. In 2026, it is envisaged that the seabed mapping programme will be complete and Infomar phase two will, be, will have completed the entire mapping of the Irish offshore. That will be, that'll be also 60 years since the Apollo 1 mission completed. And in 2029, 60 years after Neil Armstrong walks on the moon, wouldn't it be nice if we could land our own goals and have the five gigawatts of power ready to come on stream for 2030? I started off talking about 13 minutes to the moon, and now I'm going to leave you with 13 more minutes of Zoom. I know you all are pretty fatigued at this stage of Zoom calls and webinars, etc. So I'll try and keep it as informative and exciting as possible. One last thing though, it's worth noting that even NASA had some geophysical equipment with them up in that Apollo 11 mission. They brought a, a seismometer with them to measure the subsurface of the moon. And on to the Inframar program. What has that got to do with space? Well, as you've seen previously, NASA thought it was worthwhile recording what was beneath the surface, and so do we. You can see here a variety of beautiful pictures from the Inframar survey. In the bottom left-hand corner, there's a beautiful image of a wreck, the SS Polwell. We also see some nice sediment waves in the Irish Sea. But as well as nice pictures, the Inframar program is also of huge benefit to the ORE industry. In the, the maps in the middle of the slide here, you can see the bathym bathymetry data set as stands. This data set is an excellent data set acquired to international hydrographic standards. It is envisaged that it will be completed by 2026. There is some data gaps that you can note on the map, but these should be filled in by the time the survey is complete. Also acquired along with the bathymetry data is the backscatter data. What is backscatter, you might ask? Backscatter is when different seafloor types return the acoustic signal with different levels of energy. The different values in intensity, or scatter, are used to examine the nature of the seafloor in a backscatter chart. Now this is just a relative pro property and not quantified. Therefore, sometimes what gives you a hard signal may just be sand that has got some cement through it or is more finely grained than the previous, uh, previously recorded in other parts of the seabed. On to the shallow seismic and sub-bottom profile data. This is the most important data set for the ORE industry. What is it? Well, you've probably heard these different terminologies being thrown out. Pinger, chirper, sparker. And no, they're not bars from the 1990s. They are different acoustic measurements and different arrays, which offer different penetrations through the seabed and subsurface. What you can see here on the left-hand side is Pinger, Chirper, and Sparker, and they're different frequencies and they're different rates of penetration through the seabed, with Pinger being the shallowest and Sparker being the deepest. Sparker is of the most benefit as it gives the deepest penetration beneath the seabed. However, it's also the most infrequent in the Inframar data set. The Inframar data set's data quality is also variable, ranging from poor quality to good quality, as you can see in the images. Even in the good quality images, you can see the sub, the seafloor multiple, which is prevalent beneath it. And on the right-hand side, I've got an image from the Dogger Bank in the UK, where even there, with high quality shallow seismic data, they struggle with the seafloor reflector. The sub-bottom data set has evolved over time, as one would expect, with poor quality data set at the start of the Inframar program with better quality in the subsequent years. It is also a function of what the subsurface is beneath it. But there is times that 
even with what is perceived as poor quality data, you can enhance it through processing and reprocessing. This is a case study from Dundalk Bay. This is the initial input, and this is after some initial processing by Dub down under GeoSolutions, who offered to look at this data set and offer some geophysical solutions to it. And what you can see here is quite a prevalent seabed multiple. For those of you who don't know what a seabed multiple is, it is basically a repeat of the signature of the seafloor bottom, but it's not the primary signal. Therefore, it should be removed and can, or can lead to errors in the subsurface interpretation. And here we go with the seafloor multiple removed, and all that is left now is the geology that lies underneath. Let's have a zoom in and see that again. This was the data set after initial processing, and what you can note here is there's a, a problem with statics on the seabed reflector. What are statics? Statics is that jittery, noisy looking substance that you can see, which makes, makes things ha hard to decipher and see. Also, ampli amplitude preservation and noise is an issue. Once we apply more sophisticated processing techniques, we can, we can, allow, we can enhance this data set. Here we see it. I'm just going to flick over and back between the two. Before and after, it's like night and day, foggy, unfoggy, and allows for a much more detailed geological interpretation. Here we can see channel fill, older channel fill, a large channel cut, overbank deposits, and possible slumping, all of which will have different sediment properties and different settlement rates, which you will need to know about if you are planning to build a wind farm in this area. Data integration is key when unlocking both the Inframar products and any other relevant sources of information. We talked before about a lot of the geophysical products that Inframar acquire. However, it is necessary to calibrate these with hard data. CPTs and cores are essential for getting the soil and rock properties for the seafloor and what lies beneath. The Geological Survey of Ireland offer, also offers additional information which may be of relevance to the ORE sector. Here is a geological map of Ireland with the faults overlaying on top of it. You can see a variety of lithologies and when you overlay the river systems on top of this, you can see what lithologies are being eroded into your area of interest as that has implications of what sediment is on the seabed and what sediment also is under the seabed. The Petroleum and Affairs Division also holds a wealth of information from the oil and gas industry. Hundreds of millions of euros were spent on these data sets and they would be of huge benefit to the ORE sector. You can see the complete data set overlaying here on top of the bathymetry from Inframar. This is a section which shows the seismic line from PAD overlaying with a, the insert from a sub-bottom profile data. And what you can see here is that the seismic line or deep seismic line is shown a lot more geological information, which is of benefit to the ORE sector. It gives you a better understanding of what is going on, particularly of faults that go to the seabed and of potential shallow gas. Also, some of these 3D data sets offer the opportunity to really bring out some beautiful features on the seabed as the image below. And what, you will, and what you will find in many occasions is that the features you see on the seabed are directly linked to the tectonics which underlie them. On the bottom right hand corner is the final result which we are aiming for, an integrated 3D ground model, which will happen when we integrate all available data sources together. So where are we? Currently in Ireland, we produce 25 megawatts offshore Arclo. So there's quite a gap between that and the five gigawatts the government, government want generated by 2030. On the top left-hand side, you can see a map showing some of the foreshore license applications in the Irish Sea. It is envisaged that the ORE development will happen in a staged approach. First, first in the Irish Sea, followed by the Celtic Sea, and then finally into the Atlantic. Technology is evolving all the time in the ORE industry, as demonstrated here in this diagram, as turbines have the ability to move further and further offshore. 
This is important, particularly if we want to move to the Atlantic coast. Recently, Simply Blue Energy announced the, the Western Star project. This innovative project will look at a combination of floating wind and wave energy to pr produce electricity on the west coast of Ireland. Many of these projects will need green hydrogen to reach an export market as grid infrastructure alone will not be enough. Green hydrogen can be produced when water is split between oxygen and hydrogen by an electrolyzer. This may happen onshore or as technology advances, even offshore. There are other emerging technologies such as tidal, wave, geothermal and CCS but unfortunately, we don't have the time to discuss these in any detail in this presentation. The evolution of the ORE sector in Ireland. The Infomar datasets will continue to provide an essential toolkit for supporting Ireland's ORE sectoral development in Ireland, in particular site selection, seabed infrastructure and landfall. Data integration and calibration are key components of this. Policymakers, capital providers, and industry need to work together to ensure that everyone is pulling in the same direction to achieve the common goal of reaching the 2030 targets. Grid infrastructure will need to evolve for the government targets to be met. If Ireland aspires to be a net exporter of clean energy, larger interconnectors will have to be constructed to the UK and Europe. Building the supply chain is an important factor that needs to be considered when scaling up. The UK market divided into eight infrastructure hubs for the ORE industry. Ireland has several potential infrastructure hubs and needs a strategic plan if it is to avoid using the UK as a supply base. Intermittency and storage remain key concerns for renewable energy. Combination of floating offshore wind and green hydrogen could pave the way for ORE hubs to be established on the South and Atlantic coasts, providing much needed employment and socio-economic disadvantaged areas. And finally, the Marine Area Planning Bill could be the catalyst which enables the evolution of the ORE sector in Ireland. This one small step could provide a giant leap for the industry. I hope you've enjoyed listening. This has been a very high level presentation. For more details, please download the report. And if you have any queries, please get in contact. Hello, my name's Lucy Katz, and I'm going to be giving you an overview of Gavin and Doherty's review of data needs for the offshore renewable energy sector, which was undertaken for the Infomar programme. So we've gone through a number of uh, sections in our review. First of all, we looked at the near-term and long-term ORE sector data needs. Uh, and then we looked at a geophysical and geotechnical data gap analysis between Infomar's deliverables and those needs. We then looked at how that gap can be bridged, uh, both by Infomar, but also by industry and the use of complementary information. We then considered the Infomar data value to the ORE sector and some industry engagement recommendations. So for near-term ORE sector needs, this is driven a lot by the condition of the market, and this takes us up to 2030. So currently the ORE sector in Ireland operates as a developer-led or centralised model. And this means developers are responsible for everything from site identification through to building, operating and decommissioning. So to achieve Ireland's target of five gigawatts by 2030, this is going to require a robust re consenting regime, a subsidy support scheme and the facilitation of grid connections to enable developers to meet those targets. The framework underpinning this is defined in the draft National Marine Planning Framework, which was published in November 9, 2019 and expected to be finalised shortly. It includes provision of statutory development management guidelines for the marine area and a set of offshore wind specific guidelines. So the renewable energy electricity support scheme and the grid connection policy, the enduring connection policy are both now in operation and offshore specific res auctions will be held going forward. And the first major reform of marine consenting is currently being legislated for through the Maritime Area Planning Bill which is a high priority and efficient passage through the houses is expected following introduction in Q2 2021. So we can drill down into consenting needs and stakeholder requirements, which essentially are what defines when you need your data at what stage of your project. Whatever the regime, we know we're going to need high quality data 
to satisfy environmental legislation, i.e. to undertake environmental impact assessments. And so developers can bid into res auctions with a high price certainty, i.e. having a full understanding of the amount of energy their site can generate, which means they need to understand the geology, the wind conditions, the ocean conditions, etc. Multiple rounds of res auctions are going to be held. Uh, the earliest projects being developed in Ireland, Arklow and the relevant projects, will likely target the first auction, Res 1, whereas new projects will target 2 and 3. So the first major milestone for those developers is getting a foreshore licence for early stage site investigations. However, at this point, the site is not exclusive to those developers. The first major consenting milestone is going to be obtaining a conditional maritime area consent, which is where you get site exclusivity. And we can see some timelines here for relevant projects and new projects. And the total uh, length of those schedules is different. But early on, you can see we need to complete both the EIA and um, the RES award in order to get to the more detailed design phases. So what controls the data we need for the design phases for the wind farm? That's going to rely on the current foundation technologies for the near term. And in the near term, we're looking primarily at fixed wind solutions, so driven monopiles, but also driven pile jackets and gravity based foundations. Monopiles are by far dominating the market and the East Coast is most favourable for those projects, which is why that's where most of the projects are currently um, concentrated. To understand the site capacity and suitability, we need to think about water depths, depths to bedrock, geological conditions and the seabed and subseabed hazards. We also need to think about other factors such as seabed stability, mobility and scour potential. On the right, we can see broadly a summary of the different foundation types. Um, what comes out of that is essentially to understand that for monopiles and jackets, especially in deeper water, regularly you will need investigation depths uh, to understand the geology and the seabed of more than 50 metres below seabed. Uh, whereas for cables, the depth of interest is typically less than 10 metres below seabed but you do need very high resolution in those areas. So near term, in summary, we're primarily looking at fixed wind, uh, primarily monopiles, um, in water depths of less than 70 metres. The depth of site characterisation is going to be up to 100 metres below seabed to inform foundation development stages. And the highest resolution data is going to be needed in the top five to 10 metres to inform environmental impact assessments and cable routing. The typical data, uh, geophysical and geotechnical data that's going to be required, bathymetry, side scan sonar, magnetometer, magnetic radiometer, shallow seismic, medium penetration seismic uh, in the foundation depth range, and of course, targeted geotechnical data and lab testing. But you don't necessarily need all the data at the beginning of the project. And we can look at the project development timeline and say, when do we need these data? What resolution, um, what coverage? And early on, when looking at site viability and thinking about early stage foundation optioneering, we can get away with very high level information. So bathymetry data doesn't necessarily need to be current or down to 0.5 metre resolution. We need indicative depth to bedrock and geotechnical parameters, but you don't need detailed mapping across the site. We will need more up to date seabed information for the environmental impact assessment, which is also required to successfully get through auction. Once we've passed through auction, this is where we start needing more current and more detailed data to undertake front-end engineering design, feed, which includes layout optimization and selection of cable routes. And then after the final investment decision, this is when the most detailed investigations take place with the most current data, very targeted on individual foundation locations. In the long term, we need to think about how the market environment will change. So there are strong indications that there's going to be a move to a much more centralised renewable energy model. So instead of developers taking projects through from start to finish, the state will take control of selecting sites and potentially also collecting data, storing data and distributing data, maybe even managing assets. So for long term projects, this means um, that focus is likely to shift to foundation concepts that can take advantage of areas not congested by fixed foundation projects, which is going to mean the south coast, the west coast and deeper water areas of the east coast and in those areas we're looking primarily at um, floating wind concepts which are well suited to deeper water areas although certainly some fixed solution um, projects will continue in areas of deeper water. So floating wind there are different types of wind platform 
but the key thing from a G and G data perspective and an investigation of the subsurface is the type of mooring and the type of anchor. And anchors can vary from drag anchors or suction piles, driven piles. Uh, the key difference compared to near-term needs is floating foundations will be in deeper waters, but will be taken to shallower depths below seabed. So we'll still have a similar stage investigation process, but the depths of interest and the environments for those investigations will change. Although it's anticipated that cabling considerations will remain largely the same. The other impact we need to think about in terms of the sector um, data needs uh, is about data delivery. So if we move to a plan led model or a centralized model, this means it's going to change who's responsible for collecting data, processing and interpreting those data and storing and distributing those data. In a centralized system, there's going to be a need for a full time role at the state body for organizing and managing activities pre development, including data collection. And the state body will need capacity to store, catalog and distribute these data. And also, there's probably going to be a need for defined data standards where data is being collected on behalf of the state. So we can take those near term and long term needs and think about the suitability of the G&G data that Infomar currently provide. And the Infomar programme was designed primarily for seabed mapping. So all the additional data we get, uh, the seismic data, is essentially data of opportunity. And it's an incredibly valuable resource. When we look at the ORE sector data needs, we can see that from the Infomar programme, we have really valuable information on water depths, which is one of the key things we need to determine foundation suitability. And we also have really good information on geology or depth of bedrock within the top 10 metres because of all the shallow seismic data that Infomar collect. We have enough information to consider seabed mobility, environmental baseline data, although this is partly dependent on the coverage and the age of the data, uh, ecological data, obstructions and infrastructure mapping. Where we have the biggest gaps are the deeper you go, the less likely you are to get information from Infomar Seismic, because primarily we're using shallow penetration systems, which have a limit of maybe 25 to 30 metres. There's also some single channel seismic, which gives us a little more depth extension, but the distribution is much less compared to the single channel uh, shallow seismic. And below about 50 metres below seabed, uh, Infomar Seismic data doesn't really uh, cover that range. And we don't have any geotechnical information other than very shallow grabs and cores and obviously knowing that geotechnical information is key for thinking about foundation options. So how do we bridge the gap? Well we can look at what the Infomar program could do uh, and these recommendations are driven by the ORE sector that doesn't mean they all necessarily need to be uh, implemented it will depend on which ones are judged to be most cost effective and certainly Infomar have a very user-friendly portal in place uh, for which minor adjustments could really increase the usability, for example, uh, using a systematic line and file naming convention and using sensor specific track plots. Uh, for data formats, hydrographic data are provided in standard formats, but it would be also good to do the same thing for seismic and geotechnical data, where we recommend SegWi and AGS formats respectively. For data delivery, the portal is already sufficient for near term development needs, as has been demonstrated on many projects. Uh, in the long term, should we move to a more centralised model, it's a very attractive option to develop that portal further rather than starting from scratch. But this will have impacts on stored data volumes and site traffic. So for survey scopes and data collection, there are several recommendations in the report, not all of which necessarily need to be taken up. It will depend on which is judged to be most cost effective. The key ones we have thought about are transition from WGS 84 to ETRS 89 for serving data because ETRS 89 coordinate system is fixed to the European plate. There's also the potential to use unmanned survey vehicles to uh, increase coverage with shallow seismic, bathymetry and backscatter without taking up valuable ship time. Uh, for single channel data that's currently acquired, so Pinger, Chirp and Inamar, uh, it would be valuable potentially to increase the weighting of data quality uh, against acquisition efficiency. Um, for single channel Sparker, uh, the system that Infomar already deploy is very useful. Um, we'd recommend targeted acquisition where bedrock is more than 25 meters depth, uh, which will be more efficient than a, a broad campaign. And for magnetometer surveying, currently magnetometer surveying by Infomar is carried out with a constant toe depth. And we would recommend a constant altitude, which will be more useful for infrastructure mapping. And for seabed sampling, there's a great resource of seabed samples, grab samples, drop calls, etc. 
um, but the distribution is variable. So we'd recommend a targeted gap filling approach using existing seabed classification maps that Infomar have produced. And there's also potential for additional types of data collection. Um, so acoustic Doppler current profilers to look at current velocities and turbulence, which is really important for calculating loads on marine structures. Uh, Multi-channel seismic, which is going to be most useful where the bedrock is deep and water is shallow. And multi-channel seismic is required to get the investigation depth needed for foundations. Uh, in terms of geotechnical data, uh, as we've identified, there's a large gap in terms of geotechnical information. And potentially this could be partially resolved by undertaking a targeted CPT campaign, so cone penetrometer testing, uh, off the east coast and bays near Galway and Donegal, which are most suitable areas for this kind of testing. And also, if possible, collection of boreholes, again, targeted on areas of greatest uncertainty. In order to help projects pass through environmental impact assessment, it would also be really valuable to do biological sample collection when undertaking grabs and to undertake uh, image and video collection as routine for flora and fauna identification. So in terms of geographic areas, uh, there's also value in undertaking repeat bathymetry surveys to investigate seabed mobility. Uh, this targeted single channel sparker data collection uh, and multi channel data collection, and also CPT campaign. So, what complementary information is out there that we can use to build upon the Infomar database um, that already exists? There's open access information, so obviously publications and research, and eModnet. Uh, eModnet serves data collected by Infomar, but also other information such as coastal retreat data. And of course, maps and memoirs from the BGS and the Geological Survey Ireland. There's also commercial data out there. Um, and a, a non-obvious source, but one that could be quite useful, is other offshore renewable energy developers. So if a developer drops out of a project, an arrangement could be made to share data they've collected to date. And as we move into a more centralised model, there's potential for legacy project data to be passed on to the state and then served back out again if a site comes back into contention, for example, using a different foundation technology. There are lots of pipelines and cables out there, all of which will have had pre and post installation surveys. And for pipelines, certainly there'll be annual inspection reports, which can be very useful for considering cabling conditions. And also oil and gas data. There's a huge archive of 2D and 3D seismic data shown in the map on the right, um, which is taken from the Petroleum Affairs Division. And archive data are of limited use without reprocessing. Uh, and the usefulness is very much dependent on the acquisition settings, the formats and the age of the data, which means uh, it's going to be very much a site specific and data set specific assessment to see if these data could be useful. Due to the geographic distribution and the fact these data are slightly more limited in use close to the seabed, this is going to be most useful for sites looking to develop deep foundations in deeper waters. So, bridging the gap, industry responsibilities. Developers will need to undertake seismic data processing, interpretation and ground modelling to make the most of Infomar data. And it's necessary that at an early stage of the desk study phase, it is established what data are available from Infomar and if the depth coverage and the spatial coverage are enough to understand the site geology. If it's not, you'll need to undertake more survey. Uh, this may mean more geophysical survey if the depth of interest needs to be extended. Uh, more geophysical survey will be required post auction. Geotechnical surveying will almost certainly be required pre auction to get some geotechnical information to quantify the geophysical interpretation and will be required for feed activities. And the geophysical survey should be used to target the geotechnical campaigns. You'll also need to make sure you've got sufficient environmental impact assessment data. So, to summarise the value of Infomar data to the ORE sector, for near term developments, it's in the pre auction phase to assess site viability and foundation auctioneering for sites where bedrock is less than 25 metres below seabed, to understand cable route geology, and to reduce the scope and the cost of pre-auction G and G surveys. It has greater value in the cable route areas due to the shallow depth of interest compared to foundation areas, and the availability of baseline infomar data for specific areas is highly valuable, valuable and may negate the need for environmental baseline survey at an initial stage. In the long term, for floating wind, this value is still in the pre-auction stages primarily and may be greater in the turbine areas due to the shallower foundation depth of interest. And long term, the value of the project and its legacy 
maybe to use the existing programme infrastructure to build on for a more centralised data strategy post 2030. And all of this needs industry engagement to make sure people are aware of what Infomar can be used for and what it cannot be used for. And that needs to inc include developers, but also consultants working in the Irish wind sector, stakeholders, for example, the underwater archaeology unit and g, &G survey contractors who are unfamiliar with local conditions and could get steer from Infomar, uh, can use Infomar coverage to optimise the value of their own data and also to consider the basis for Infomar and G&G survey collaboration in the future to maximise the value of data collected in the Irish offshore sector. Thank you for your time. Good morning, how do you do? My name is Peter Heath and I'm the data manager for the Marine and Coastal Unit here at Geological Survey Island. I've got two talks to you this morning, each one lasting just a few minutes long. First talk is about uh, the best way to access Infomar data by using our data viewers um, data downloads portal and also our services. And then next, I'll be showing you our new Segway sub bottom download layers as well. So first off, the best way to access Infomar data um, and navigate our resources is to head over to Infomar.ie. Um, once you get there, essentially three different paths you can go down. First one is to use our data viewer. Next is to use um, our data downloads portal, Jetstream. And uh, finally, there's a lot of bespoke viewers as well as um, bespoke products as well. So first off, if you head over to um, interactive maps section, you'll find a link to the, the data viewer. I'll just have a more in-depth look at that. Here are all of our core product layers. As you see at the bottom, we've got the bathymetry and then the shaded relief version of that. Then we've got more properties um, of the seabed itself. We've got the backscatter layers, sediment classification, as well as the ground truthing point. And then we've also got more details about the survey legs themselves. So we've got the survey track lines, as well as um, survey coverage areas. The more ancillary layers, such as the priority bays, as well as um, the maritime boundaries. And of course, last but not least, we've also got the, um, the shipwrecks database. So one layer I'd like to draw your attention to is the, the survey coverage uh, polygon. And in here, if you have an area of interest, essentially this allows you to see exactly what survey legs intersect with your area of interest. And if you have shape files of that, you can also bring that into the data viewer with the, the add data function as well, which is really handy. So next, moving away from the data viewer, we're just gonna have a quick look at some of the more um, bespoke, bespoke data viewers. So here is the dynamic web map viewer. And in here, you can essentially tailor the depth range and the color ramp to, to your requirements. So as you see here, we've got the depth going all the way down to 5,000 meters. So the near shore area doesn't show much relief. So if we just uh, change the depth range over here, you can see that the relief is now um, more evident now that we set a very much smaller range. Let's head over to another bespoke viewer. Here's a uh, shipwrecks viewer. So this holds the shipwrecks database. Each of the points has a number of uh, attributes as well as um, additional functionality such as uh, 3D sketch fab images of some of the wrecks. Next, this is the, the seabed and sediments viewer. Again, this holds the sediments and ground truthing database. Again, each of the points has a number of attributes to, to help you, as well as um, images of some of the grab samples too. You can also query this data set um, by the percentage of gravel, sand and mud within the samples themselves. As well as this, we've also got um, PDF map products. So as you can see, as you hover over the squares, it shows you what um, PDF products are available. Now, if we have a look at one of these in more detail, you can see here, this is um, PDF uh, symmetry uh, chart for Galway Bay, as well as this, we've also got the backscatter shady relief versions of this. And if we have a look at some um, full size one, here is um, one of the charts for uh, sediment classification in Galway Bay as well. Next, moving away from the data viewer and the bespoke viewers, 
If you want to download our data, best thing to do is to go to the data tab, click on the image, and it's all directed to our data downloads portal, Jetstream. Once you get to Jetstream, very simply, you simply um, select your area of interest, click proceed to download, then you'll be met with a list. This list shows you all of the formats uh, and products we have available. Of course, our core product is XYZ uh, Bathymetry. And as well as this, we also accompany this with ArcGIS grids. We've got Shader Relief GeoTIFFs, um, as well as many backscatter products as well. Now, going back to the survey coverage, which I spoke to you about earlier, uh, if you want to download that and take it into your own GIS software, you can. Simply head to Vector Datasets, Offshore, Offshore Shapefiles, and that will then take you to um, the list uh, to allow you to download that. That was very much a very quick whistle-stop tour of our data viewer download portal and services. Please head to info.ie uh, for more, more information. Thank you very much. Now time for part two. So now I'm just gonna introduce you to our new sub-bottom data download layers. So what exactly are we releasing? So releasing two new layers. The first one is survey polygon coverage layer. And this is essentially going to be showing uh, the full extent of our sub-bottom data holdings. Secondly, we're gonna be producing detailed track lines generated from the actual sub-bottom file itself. And attached onto these track lines is going to be um, all the data download links and resources. As well as that, we're also gonna be producing um, 2D transect preview images of the actual sub-bottom data itself and appending these to the lines. So when we were creating these new layers, we had three aims in mind. First one was we want to um, make all of our sub-bottom data holdings available in an open data format. Well, currently, a lot of the data is in proprietary formats such as Coda and JSF. Um, so we wanted, by converting this to an open data format, break down barriers, um, formats, licensing, um, software barriers to allow uh, users to access the data as freely and easily as possible. Secondly, we have approximately six terabytes of sub-bottom data holdings. Currently, this is only available by email request only. So we want this new viewer to be um, self-serving and autonomous as, as possible, allowing users to come and go to download as they please. Thirdly, we want to make the data more visually accessible to the users. So we're doing this in two different ways. Firstly, by creating detailed track lines from the actual sub-bottom files themselves, allowing the user to very quickly see the geographic extent of the data. And secondly, by producing the 2D transect preview images, we would like the users to be able to visually interpret data very quickly as well. So here's the first of the two layers that we're we're releasing. Um, as I mentioned before, we're currently in the process of converting all of our data into, into SegWi. Um, however, all of the data in our data holdings is available. So in the orange polygons you can see there, this is data which we have available by email request. And um, uh, we're currently in the process of converting it. If you look at the, the dark green polygons, this is data that we have converted into SegWi and is available via download links. And if you look at the light green polygons, this is data which we have available in the SegWi and also um, it's got preview images available for it as well. So I'll be coming on to the preview images shortly. So this is the second layer which we have available or an example of. This is the detailed track lines. Now again, as I mentioned about um, allowing all our downloads to be self-service, all of the the links are available in the attributes. So just to quickly go through them, start off with, we've got the actual file, SegWi file name of the file that generated the track line. You've got the vessel that collected it, the leg it was collected on, how many sub-bottom lines are available in that leg. Then you've got the actual data download link, as well as the size of the, um, the tar file you'll be downloading. You can also download the shape file um, for this, this leg as well. We've also got a data guide, which covers things such as um, coordinates considerations, as well as um, known issues about the data. Then also the survey reports. And as I'm gonna come on to next, we've also got uh, a link to download 
the preview image, and also you can download all the images for that leg as well. So as I mentioned, all the detailed track lines have been regenerated from the actual sub bottom file themselves. So wherever you see a line, we have corresponding data for that line. Coming on to the preview images now, at the bottom of the, the download attributes, there is um, going to be a tiny preview image. If you click on that, it's going to take you to a full size preview image. Now, if I was to talk you through this, at the very top of this preview image, you're seeing a 2D transect of the sub bottom data. Directly below that in orange, we've got the track line of this exact area overlaid on the bathymetry for, for that area. Directly below that again, we've got the track line overlaid on the backscatter for that area. Now the idea here is that we'd like the user to rapidly assess the quality of the data and also the geological features in the area. These plots auto scale, so longer the line, longer the plot, as I'll show you in a second, and they're approximately about 10% of the size of the actual Segway file itself, so nice and lightweight. Here is um, an example of a longer plot as well. So that was a very quick um, whistle stop tour as well. If you'd like to view these data sets, head over to infomar.ie, interactive maps, data viewer. As I mentioned, these new layers hold um, what we currently have available at Segway, and over the next couple of months, we'll be converting the rest of our data holdings and making them available in this layer as well. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Pete, and thank you to all our speakers there. The two, those uh, uh, two new reports from uh, Ilmatic and, and GDG are both on the Informar website already, and Pete has also uh, that link for the new uh, viewer. Is in, the, is in the chat line there, but again, that's linked off informar.ie. Uh, there's a, should be a little poll should have appeared on your screen now. And uh, please fill that in. And it's just a, our attempt to get a bit of audience feedback. Uh, so which of the following Informar focus areas would have the most positive impact on ORE development um, uh, based on some of the information you've heard this morning for the development of the MSC module or the MSC module material with an ORE focus developing data products like this sub-bottom profile uh, web service you've just seen, or seeking to develop an ancillary RE area focused baseline geophysical and geotechnical program, which might be a bit more complex to develop. So please uh, fill in the poll and we'll be able to give you the results uh, probably after, after the panel, I think is the idea. Um, now I want to introduce our, our panelists, um, our, our live panelists and uh, who've joined us and we'll get a chance to kind of also get a chance to reflect maybe on some of the, the questions in the Q&A. So please keep using the, the Q&A. You can also use it for the panel. Uh, first off, I'll introduce uh, Martina Hennessy. And Martina is a principal officer at the offshore, for offshore renewable energy here in our department of uh, environment, uh, climate and communications. And Martina's one of the key people who's gonna help develop, the, develop already for Ireland. And uh, well, well qualified to do so with a, a background that includes everything from the Marine Institute to the EPA to PER and, and Microsoft. Uh, we work very closely with Martine and delighted she can join us. Um, Peter Coyle uh, doesn't really need a, an introduction to most of this audience, I imagine. Peter is the Executive Chairman of Marine Renewables Industry Association, Mr. Marine Renewables, and runs a fantastic MRIA uh, seminar uh, every year. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, Jared Peters. Uh, Jared is an example, I guess, of, of the, new, the new crop of, uh, of people working in, in the new industry. So Jared was formerly with the UCC group of Andy Wheeler working on cold water corals and is now a survey director with Green Rebel Marine based in Cork. And uh, Philip Nugent, Philip's gonna chair the session. Philip's the assistant secretary in our department with responsibility for a rather broad brief, natural resources, waste, circular economy. Uh, which includes uh, the Geological Survey and, and Infomar, and he chairs actually the Infomar uh, program board. But also his background before joining us, he was with Department of Housing and Planning then on uh, and, and dealt with uh, some of the marine planning development. So I'll hand over to, to Philip uh, for the panel session. Thank you, Philip. Thanks, uh, thanks, Poon. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks to the, the speakers earlier on. 
uh, as well. Some some really interesting stuff there and quite inspirational. Actually, when uh, when you see the challenge presented in such a positive way, interesting timing uh, for the seminar. It's been a big week in terms of uh, climate action with the publication of the bill on Tuesday. And there's an interesting um, op-ed in the Irish Times this morning. Uh, discussing the bill and it talks about, uh, it says that the most important thing now is for the government and society to get on with the business of delivering decarbonisation. Time is not on our side. When it comes to climate, the best time to start was decades ago. The second best time to start is now. And obviously decarbonisation of the energy sector is a major challenge, but it's a huge opportunity as well. And uh, we can uh, we can see that some of the, the stars are starting to align now, I think, in, uh, in a number of ways. And some of the speakers picked up on that this morning in terms of the forward plan, the National Marine Planning Framework going to government soon and hopefully going to the Oireachtas fairly soon for final adoption. We've seen real momentum on the, uh, the, the legislation, the former MPDM and now the Marine Area Planning uh, Bill, um, and that's going to be a, a crucial piece of the overall jigsaw. And then Infomar itself is a really important part in terms of understanding the environment, understanding the, uh, the, the, the bathymetry, the, the, the geophysical conditions, um, and hopefully reducing cost, reducing risk by putting a lot of information out there, by uh, developing a clearer understanding of what the what the seabed conditions are. But maybe for this morning's, uh, for this panel, I'd like to maybe talk about some of the some of the marine planning stuff. As Coen said, I have a bit of a background in that area. So if I could ask, uh, put the same question to all of the uh, all of the panel members. So as I mentioned, the the National Marine Planning Framework is going to be published soon. That's going to set out a long-term framework for how marine activities and development will be planned and delivered in a finite space, albeit a very large one. And part of the value of long-term plans is around managing potential conflict at a strategic level. So I'd like to ask the, uh, the panel members how they think the ORI sector can use Infomar as a basis for engagement with other marine users and for addressing or mitigating potential spatial conflicts before they arise at a very local level or at a project level. So big question I know. So basically, how can the sector use Infomar in the context of the National Marine Planning Framework to, uh, to avoid uh, conflict or to, to use it as a tool for, for informing conflict resolution? Kuhn, I might unfairly start with you. No problem at all. Um, no problem at all with that. I mean, I think it's, it's quite interesting. There's almost a Having, having been project manager with Infomar and then given the data policy we have in GSI, there's almost a bit of a not psychological or philosophical end to this, but one of the things with Infomar, the fact we make all the data available for free online, kind of without fear and favor, has always been a real plus of the program. And I know when we've had, our, we've had a lot of engagement with people on both sides of the fence for and against things. And I've examples I've used in the past where a specific one on Dunleary um, Harbour development where we had both the objectors to uh, an extension to the pier looking at cruise ships and stuff, but the objectors and the developers used the Infomar data. One to look at, you know, to minimize cost, like you say, and the other to say, well, actually, if you look at the sub bottom data, the objectors were saying it might require blasting and that might be a negative. So I, I think, you know, apart from the obvious that it's the, you know, reducing costs and everything else, the fact that it's a government program that's putting all its data out there helps, I think, helps the start of the discussion or the open discussion. I mean, the same data that we're using to try to plan for site optimization for wind farms, the exact same data was used for selecting SACs in the deep water for cold water corals. It's the same data. It's there were questions there about wave energy. It, they all need the same data. So it's the same as OSI data onshore. You wouldn't think of building something without a map onshore. It's the same offshore. So in terms of it, it can be used very, very much as, well, here's the base, here's the base we're working off and everyone has access to this information. So that's, you know, without getting into the technical side of it, I think that that can be quite useful. I found that quite useful. Thanks, Kuhn. Thanks, Kuhn. Um, Peter, I know that the, uh, the need to ensure uh, successful coexistence with other marine users is a big focus for the MRIA. So uh, same question to you. You're just on mute there, Peter. Sorry, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Um, complex question, uh, Philip, and you're certainly reflecting your background there in marine spatial planning, etc. Um, clearly, 
data, objective and recognized and accepted data is the foundation for all debate. And I think Kuhn has, has touched on that. If I could make some points around that issue, I think, first of all, we have a lot of sources of information about what's happening in the marine around the place. Um, it's not clear as to where all of that is and how good all of it is. And I'm talking beyond Infomar. And there is a need to develop protocols around marine data, uh, particularly standards. And I know the Marine Institute has been looking at that, and that's important work. I think Infomar um, particularly feeds into something that you will know is close to my heart, and that's the idea of coastal partnerships. We are not going to be able to develop offshore renewable energy without engaging in a long-term and structured way with the communities that we affect. And I'm not just talking about villages and towns along the coast, but I'm also talking about people who use the sea, such as surfers, fishers, etc. So Inframar, as Kuhn has pointed out, is going to make a critical contribution in, in that area. Um, I think there's a, a whole issue around ensuring that in the debate that will emerge about um, uh, offshore renewable energy, that there's good cooperation and good links. Again, I come back to this issue of data protocols between Infomar on the one hand and the various data companies that are emerging. And I noticed that Jared Peters is uh, on the uh, panel this morning from Green Rebel Marine who are investing heavily in data gathering, not necessarily the sea bottom, but data gathering uh, capabilities in terms of aircraft and ships. We've also noticed recently that main port uh, shipping company in Cork has bought a survey vessel. So there are other actors coming in onto the scene and it's important that all the uh, actors work together uh, and cooperate with one another so that there's no dilution in the public acceptability of the uh, the data that is being uh, gathered and disseminated. Um, so those are my initial thoughts. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Martina, would you like to take that one? Uh, thank you, Philip, and good morning, everyone. Um, I might uh, refer back to, to something that was touched on in one of the presentations about the move to a more plan-led uh, regime for offshore uh, renewable energy development. Um, and this is where I think the Inframar data is going to be play a key role uh, in us uh, as a state uh, trying to identify the optimal areas for future development. So we're currently starting from a developer-led model where there are a number of existing projects. But we want to move to a situation where we have identified the best areas for future development in the long run, taking into account constraints and conflicts, et cetera. So the, the National Marine Planning Framework provides a really valuable foundation uh, to enable all of this work to move forward. But really what's going to be critical is using data and Inframar data is one of those critical elements. I think what we, we also will need to do as part of the development or identification of these areas, you know, we're going to start work very shortly on a new version of the ORE development plan. The last one was, was published in 2014. And really we wanted to assess if we can get down to a lower level of detail than was in that plan, because that really was very high level, looking at coastal zones as a zone. I think to, to, to be more... Uh, practical and useful and to, to enable a dialogue with, with other marine users and those who, who make a living from it or are recreational, as Peter talked about. I think we need to be getting down to greater levels of detail and also bringing in other layers of data and information. So I know Parks and Wildlife, for example, uh, would have a big interest uh, from the ecological perspective in understanding what impacts might be. And there are big data gaps in some of these areas that we need to figure out how we how we plug. So I think the work that we're going to initiate on the, the next version of the development plan, which will enable this move to more plan led regime, is going to facilitate a lot of dialogue with different users and we'll be conducting um, you know, a strategic environmental assessment as part of that. And that in itself will enable a lot of that public consultation and engagement with particular groups. I think the data is a fundamental in how we objectively identify the optimal areas and then use that as a mechanism to promote debate and discussion with all uh, marine users. Thanks, Martina. Uh, Jared, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, thanks, Philip. Um, 
so as far as facilitating conflict management, I think Infomar is at a particularly sort of important uh, area in the in the in between industry and government, and it enables a lot of planning. Um, I I mean I think there's been a lot of really valid points made already. I don't have much to add to it. Um, I just point out that it's important to have a key sort of starting point. That's not, uh, you, you obviously can't provide all the data for everything on a national level, but Infomar goes a really long way to providing what we need for planning. And um, obviously, you know, the, the marine planning framework, which is coming out will go a long way. And that, that wrote on the back of a lot of information that was provided by Infomar data. So that's a key example. Like we need to have these standards in place and we really couldn't even start to make them if it wasn't for wasn't for the data underlying everything. So, yeah, it, I mean, other than the fact that it's it, it's uh, it's an obvious important step in in the right direction. It's uh, that's all I can really add to that. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Jared. Maybe just sticking with the the planning thing. Um, we're obviously, as people have mentioned, we're moving into a new development management regime, which will hopefully be a kind of a, a key enabler for achieving our 2030 targets. And the new, the role of Onboard Planola is changing the, these um, offshore wind and, and other ORE projects will come within the decision-making remit of the, of the board. So how do you think Infomar can support their decision-making processes? Um, and how can we maybe learn from other planning processes that have been kind of bogged down or found to be uh, to be uh, deficient in terms of uh, available inf information to inform decisions? How can we learn from that and ensure that uh, the decision-making on development management stage is um, evidence-based and objectively led? Martin, I might go back to you on that one. I was afraid you might do that. <laughs> um, well, obviously, the, the, the new regime is being built out at the moment. We're at the start of um, with the, the bill that you mentioned. Um, that is, once that is enacted, we're, we will have a new regulatory regime that we're currently at the point of designing. So I think given we're at the outset of this, um, it, there's opportunity to build in and to make, you know, increase the awareness of where the data is available and what the criteria are going to be used at each stage of the decision-making process. And I'll just maybe touch on one thing that I think may have been mentioned earlier about uh, data capture. You know, one of the things that we are looking at as part of the, the new uh, regime uh, that we'll be introducing is to ensure that data is captured. So if individual developers are doing any work offshore collecting data, that there is a mechanism for the state to then get access to that. And we'll be looking at having uh, repositories of data that then can be more generally available to everyone, developers and state decision makers as well. So I think there's, there is, you know, there's a lot of work has been started in building out the new regime and how it's going to work, but I think there is an opportunity um, and it's work that we've started from our perspective in ORE. Um, but, uh, you know, on board Planal we'll be making decisions on a lot of other sectors as well, not just uh, renewable energy developments. I think there's an opportunity uh, to ensure that the board has the knowledge and information and the tools and the expertise uh, available to it to enable it to, to make uh, those informed decisions that it will need to make going forward. Thanks, Martina. Uh, Peter, go to you next. Yeah, I think that Martina makes a very important point there and I'm delighted to note it that um, we need to try and avoid duplicating data collection by various developers investigating sites and end up with a lot of money being spent by various people uh, and no one having actual access apart from the people who paid for the surveys. So by poop, the, the state having access to the data and then everyone having access to the, to the data after the state has done a thing with regard to it actually is quite an important issue and one that I believe caused a lot of challenges with the Crown Estate in Scotland. So it'd be good to take that lesson on from an early stage. I think that Infomar and data is one ingredient in a complex uh, sauce. Uh, there's the uh, ingredient of um, the resource itself, 
as the ingredient of the very complex policy framework which uh, Martina and many others are involved in rolling out. Uh, and above all, there's the very important uh, uh, issue, which is reflected in the chat, which I'm just looking at on my screen here, of communication and acceptability, particularly, um, as I think we all know by the fishers, uh, the fishing community who um, believe that they are vulnerable in all of this. And um, so I think the data and Infomar uh, is part of a complex source, um, but critical to all of uh, the, to the, if you like, pouring of the source is communication and engagement with people who feel vulnerable and uh, so forth uh, from offshore renewable energy development. And that perhaps ultimately is going to be our greatest uh, challenge. Um, we are developing all the policies, we're developing the legislation, we're gathering the data, we're doing all the right things. But at the end of the day, this is perceived by various groups to impact negatively, or perhaps impact ne negatively on them. And we must address that issue. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Jared, I see you nodding to a number of the things that, uh, that, that Peter and Martina have, uh, have mentioned there. So Peter described it as uh, Infomar as one ingredient in a complex sauce, uh, but that communication would be would be critical. Yeah, I think yeah, I agree completely. I agree with the, uh, the care that needs taken with duplication of efforts and um, Infomar can help with that. Uh, that's certainly one of the innovations that we're trying to do here at Green Rebel is to is to work with the, the developers and and take a critical examination of their projects before any survey works begin so that we can ensure that we do uh, you know we have as little impact as possible and um, we're not um, we're not trying to stifle any any development we're not trying to hold anyone back from you know, Ireland moving into the future, but we're certainly trying to do it with as little impact as possible from a survey point of view. And um, that's something that we're working really hard on. We've recognized from the beginning, we, we, we have fisheries liaisons officers as part of the company. So that's a, it's a foundation of ours is to, is to be aware and communicate as best as possible, pour the sauce, like Peter said. Um, so I couldn't agree more. I think, I think having, Cold, hard data in public view is, is a critical aspect. You know, the, the more education we can provide, the more um, enlightened people are to what is going to happen and, and what needs to happen for these projects to move forward. That's really important. It, it can't just become something mysterious and scary. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my take on it. Thanks, Jared. Cool. Yeah, um, I'm not gonna, it's a good, good points made there. And I suppose two bits. First is the ABP question. I mean, it's pretty vital that they that they get technically up to speed or they've good technical people working with them. That's that's the advice. We've seen this in Groundwater and been involved in a few cases where they, they've got some good consultants and sometimes some better than others in terms of their interpretation of the data. But one of the key things is that they make sure they have all the information. Um, and they, they know how to use it. Um, the, the other one, I mean, without, without flogging the sauce analogy, sauce analogy, without putting some curry or spice into it, but I tell you, one of the issues is, um, I, I agree completely with what Martina said and, and Jared and, uh, and Peter about, you know, making the data available, but we make our data available, it's out there, that's no problem. The issue is then the contractors, the developers, for now, like we've always said, we'll happily host your data. Um, to use an example in the geotechnical area, we host geotechnical data belong to companies, but it's a grace and favor kind of situation. They know if they give us the data, they don't have to store it, we'll store it, we'll put it online. Um, but we don't have a legal requirement to get the data. And what, we'd re what we've written into every opportunity we've had, we've said, when you're putting in place regulations, legislation, make sure a copy of the data is shared, it becomes available to the state. And like for force share licenses, we request digital data and somebody sends us a PDF of a report, you know, not the surveys. So we're open for it, but we really think the carrot alone of sharing the data won't work. It has to be written in there. And it totally, I mean, the point was made by uh, Lucy in her talk that you've got 
G and G contractors will arrive over from from outside Ireland, maybe, and just start plowing away, surveying, doing their same thing they were doing in the North Sea, where there was no Infomar data, there was no seabed data. So it's a vital point, and it and it'll solve two things. It'll by making the data available, you won't have this, you know, suspicion of well, what are the companies up to? I would I would insist it like if it was up to me, it should be available from the day from the day it's acquired, um, and then people can use it, you know, and see it. And, and, you know, particularly when you've got multiple users, there's a question, long question there from on the fishers, so that they have access to data because Infomar in the past, fishermen have used the data for being able to select improved scallop fishing grounds, you know, herring fisheries, the, the tops of the, the, um, the banks are used for uh, seed mussels, which is quite a valuable business. So, you know, open data, like I've often said, is more of a religion here than a than a policy position you know but so we need to make sure that we don't have zealots coming in uh you know or or, or, or uh, atheists um so so absolutely but i think it will need to be written in it needs to be written in and enforced and the same with abp they need to ensure that there's data visibility and it does two things it'll save money for everybody and it'll also reduce some of the suspicions thanks Coon. so maybe maybe uh to round out the discussion and build on what you're you're saying about um, you know how data availability can be improved, and there uh, to provide a, a kind of an entitlement to survey data from individual operators. What would you like to see in the climate action plan, the new climate action plan that's open for consultation at the moment? If you were an external stakeholder making a submission on the uh, the new climate action plan, what would you like to see it say in terms of commitments around Infomar into the future? Uh, that that's a good one but i mean on the data side there has to be commitment that all of the, the technical data being acquired for projects is made available freely and online and shared that it has to be filed with the state and then the state has an onus to make it available publicly and whether that's onshore offshore whatever it is that should be the case all the time you know because there's huge suspicion and uh, around this issue and i see it on planning all the time and i've seen it from uh, the mineral exploration business as well uh, where if it's hard to see see the data hard to see what the results are um, and then after that, the, in terms of the, the, you know, the post 2026 Infomar and supporting the Climate Action Bill is an interesting one because, you know, everything's going to plan. We'll have all the initial initial survey work done, but we'll have a, you know, we have expertise, we've got equipment, fleet, and we're in a position then to, to do follow up work and targeted support. And it's probably the ORE, we're not, we're not a private sector surveyor, and that's a really good thing. Uh, other other surveys uh, are in that space and we're not. So so I think it's a question of how do we keep bridging the gap? How do we support ABP? How do we support the planning process? How do we manage the data portal? Maybe we become the data brokers, you know, putting the data out there. There's a lot of reference to the oil and gas data that may may be of value, but it's it's a complex enough area to get into. So that's one of the things to get into making that data available. And not processing it for everyone. We're not going to do Jared and GDG's work for them. They'd love us to, um, but you know, at least at least be able to point them at the data. At least to help them find the data and then share the data. But it's a two-way street. They need to be forced then to to share the data they're acquiring, and the clients don't care. They have their license, so it's not a problem. And it's the same with the mineral exploration. They were never bothered about sharing data because once you have your license, so that's that's really it. It's to support it the same way as to support support the fishing industry, support marine tourism and, and all the rest of it. So it needs to get written in that that data sharing isn't an afterthought, that it's actually in there as part of the, as part of the actual legislation. That's, that's what I'd want to say. Could I just come in there, Philip? Absolutely. I guess the, the question is where next for Infomar, if you were making recommendations for the Climate Action Plan, but feel free to, to add to that. Well, let me, just, let me just focus for a second on the um, issue of data sharing. Uh, very conscious that Martina, who's one of those important policymakers, is on the call and she needs to leave her pen aside for a moment. I think that I think in principle that data sharing uh, is a good idea. I think we also have to bear in mind that by the time an individual developer puts an application in at a res auction, I am told they will probably have spent something of the order of 20 million euros. So people are naturally going to be defensive about data that amongst other things, data that they have spent a huge amount of money on accumulating. But I think that the industry would be open to having a discussion with um, policymakers about the issue of 
uh, compulsory data sharing. And I think that's something that, sh that should happen. Um, and hopefully we could reach some agreement on that because the alternative of endless duplication and endless cost arising from that is not worth uh, thinking about. The other thing about onboard Planola is anything you can do to support onboard Planola going forward is really important. When you think about it, they have a, an awesome task ahead of them. Uh, our maritime territory, now that Britain has left the EU, is possibly the largest one on the Atlantic coast in terms of the European Union. And their remit now extends out hundreds of miles, or will extend out hundreds of miles off land. Um, historically, they've had no expertise in the marine area. There are concerns in industry about the pace and the scale at which they're acquiring that expertise, both on the board, in their advisory group, and in the staff. So anything that Infomar can um, do to help them develop this completely new set of skills uh, and support their decision taking with high quality and uh, objective data would be welcome. And the uh, the additional question, Peter, where next for Infomar? If you were making recommendations in the context of the Climate Action Plan for uh, for what you'd like to see Infomar and how you'd like to see it develop over the future, well, years, I, I, years, I, I, I the 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 various revised documents with regards to climate action plan have just come out so i haven't thought that through yet i would say that informar needs to work closely with uh, deck with the martinez department in focusing resources in those areas that ultimately the department uh, determines is what wants to see already take place in at an early stage so that would be the rc presumably presumably in due course the celtic sea and in the first instance on the west coast all the indications are that development will take place. That's where the most advanced work is taking place in terms of developers putting stuff together off the Clare coast. And so beyond that, I just haven't thought it through. Thanks, Peter. And Martina, how will you be uh, seeking to influence your DEC colleague, Kuhn, to ensure that Infomar supports where you yeah, want to go? I hadn't spoken to Peter before this, but uh, he has kind of put my, my answer forward. But I might just come back to a couple of points as well. Just to be clear to, to Kuhn, uh, maybe uh, I wasn't clear enough in what I said, that we are building in to the legislation that requirement for data. Now we're putting in the capability to request the data, the practicalities and so on, we will have to work through. As with all the aspects of uh, you know implementing the new regime, there will be consultation, including with industry, and perhaps a regime like we would have had in the oil and gas side where data is restricted to the company for a year or two so they get the benefit from the investment they've made and then it becomes publicly available that could be a kind of model that we look at but i, I just to we recognize the importance of data and the intention is to collect and make it available uh, and just the mechanics of that will be worked through i think in terms of the climate action plan i think there's plenty in there in terms of re ambition as it is we, we won't be adding to that but I think there is definitely scope for closer alignment with in from our uh, strategic direction and where we're going from an ORE perspective in terms of moving to that plan led regime. There's definitely opportunity uh, to, for the, the two sides of the, the department to work more closely together in, in terms of the direction. Thanks, Martina. And uh, Jared, final word to you in terms of how you would like to see Infomar evolve further. Yeah, I'm, I'm keen to continue working with Infomar. I've worked with them for years as a researcher and now from a sort of seed in industry, it's something that I continue to use as a planning device. Um, we know we have to keep up to date ourselves on what Infomar is doing because the, our clients are doing the same thing. Um, so for us, it's, it's a means of streamlining our own efforts um, to, to gather even more geodata from the seabed um, and uh, yeah it's a, it's a great jumping off point for that work but more importantly maybe I, I do see a value in having sort of an impartial data set that's just there for the public to use um, it's it's really important that everyone has this kind of base knowledge uh, to, to inform co-use and, and conflict management and things like this uh, as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jared. And thanks to, uh, to all of the panel members. Um, I know I sprang some, uh, some complex and multi-part questions on you there at, uh, at very short notice, but, uh, but thanks for the spirit in which you engaged. Uh, Kuhn, I'll hand back to you for the wrap up. 
Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And it's good to get for everyone to do Philip's homework for him as what he's going to do with Inframar after 2026. That's a, that's I'm, I'm taking notes here how to <laughs> that's how he got where he is today. Okay. And just of course, Kuhn, it'll all be my idea. It will be your idea, of course. This webinar will be deleted, you know. <laughs> uh, no, it just uh, it thanks me and everyone and, and all the speakers, all the panelists. I particularly want to thank the behind the scenes Inframar team, the people who actually do the work. Uh, who go out in the boats, who process the data, who gave some of the presentations, I guess, and uh, but more importantly, the ones who probably didn't give the presentations and are, are in the background doing the heavy lifting. We're actually on time with the seminar, which is great. It's one of the advantages, I think, of being, being live. Things don't, don't tend to drag on. Um, just to, in closing, I think it's been, it's been really useful. It's been great to get this, this focus on ORE, uh, really exciting area. And as Jared had said, really, you know, things are changing quite rapidly interesting debate on the data. It's a hot topic for us in every, in every sector across geoscience uh, for the fact that, and, and exactly that kind of system where if the data has been held for a certain amount of time um, by, the, by the company, then it can be shared. Uh, that, that should be the way it should work. Uh, I, I'd counter the 20 million investment to the 80 million on Inframar that state has invested and 32 million on the INSS. But anyway, um, I've got the poll results pop back up and it's kind of interesting that um, sort of almost neck and neck, uh, whether we should be, Inframar should be developing ORE products like the sub bottom profile viewer or seeking to develop a ORE focused baseline. Um, one of the issues I know on, on, on the ORE area, like things like CPT and that are really expensive and can require dedicated vessels beyond the capability of, of Inframar. But I think as Jared has said, and, and Peter alluded to, it's kind of meeting the industry halfway and providing this, uh, pr providing this, uh, this information is, is probably what's, what's key. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everybody. Um, stay safe in these strange times. And we look forward to hopefully having a, an Inframar seminar in Shala and hopefully in Cork is the plan in November um, in Cork City Hall. Hopefully it won't be still being used as a vaccination center at that stage. <laughs> uh, I was on a webinar yesterday with European colleagues and the German guy said, well, hopefully only two more lockdowns to Christmas. Uh, I don't, didn't appreciate his, his sense of humor. So with that, I'd like to sign off. I'd like to thank everybody for the participation and uh, thank you in particular for all the, all the questions and the interaction on the chat. Uh, the presentations will be available online on informar.ie. The reports are already up there. The web viewer, the sub bottom profile viewer is up there. And there'll be a, an available copy of, of this uh, as a recording. Any of the, we'll also keep a copy of the Q&A and the, the chat. And any questions we didn't get to, we'll post them, we'll post them up there afterwards. Thank you very much. Have a good night. <laughs>